All right. So yesterday was a lot of lecture. And so I just wanted to do a quick little thing um, after your individual home front activity. Um, just know I'll post a picture of the notes just in case. Um, we're not going to for your, your quiz, we're not going to get to the battles yet. We'll finish that up um, after your quiz uh, Friday, tomorrow. Okay. Just note after Pearl Harbor, 5 million men, they're going to volunteer for the military service. But that still wasn't enough. Okay. So the selective service will expand the draft even more. And that will get about 10 more million um, draftees. Okay. And women will join the military, but they're in support roles. They're not really going to be combat roles. Okay. All right. So I just want to point out, remember, um, the Great Depression basically ends with this wartime spending, even before we get involved in the war with all like the cash and carry and the, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, if you look, unemployment, uh, World War II created 17 million new jobs. And look, in 1944, unemployment rates 1.2%. It basically got rid of unemployment. OK. Um, and if you look the industry, like with that war production board, um, a lot of industries that, um, you know, produce consumer goods, non-essential items, the government's going to kind of take them over during the war and say, nope. And said, Henry Ford, you're going to make B-29s or something like that. Um, Consumer goods were not really produced during World War II, only military supplies, things for the war effort. OK, you also saw that the Smith Connolly Act basically made strikes illegal during um, World War II. OK, just remember what gets us out of the Great Depression, World War II spending. Also, with um, that note that we will deficit spend like crazy. Um, we spend a thousand percent more um, into debt during World War II. But again, it gets us out of the Great Depression because it basically gets rid of unemployment. OK, uh, you know that um, we will have to come up with three hundred four billion dollars. That's how much our America spends on World War Two. And that's three hundred four billion dollars back then. So it's like a trillion is more than a trillion. OK, and um, one big way of doing that is your war bonds. OK, and see all these um, propagandas to get you to buy your war bonds. OK, remember, I told you the War Production Board is in charge of deciding what to produce and like making quotas for it. OK, um, for instance, uh, during this time, American factories produced 300,000 planes, 100,000 tanks and ships um, and, you know, just a lot of manufacturing. For instance, Henry Kaiser had a shipyard in California that produced a, a ship every 14 days. Um, he used like prefabrication things where things are already made. You just have to assemble it. Um, so that really uh, produced a lot. Okay. The Office of War Information is basically... Um, they are making sure it's about propaganda. It's very similar to the Krill Committee, um, but it's all about doing the right thing, supporting America, not supporting Hitler, you know, that kind of thing. The Office of Censorship uh, read all like telegraphs and letters to make sure that, um, you know, you're loose talking to people wouldn't, the, you know, that, you know, people wouldn't find out like, oh, so and so is being stationed here. And what if that helps the enemy with that information? OK, the OPA um, was in charge of curbing inflation. So try not to increase prices. They froze prices. They also froze wages. They also were in charge of rationing. Um, rationing is mandatory um, sacrificing of goods. You had ration books and they would last for about a month. And in order to pay or in order to buy something, you had to have an unused ration. Um, so you'd probably get, you know, four cartons of eggs a month, four loaves of bread a month. And if you went to buy it and you didn't have a, an unused ration for it, you could not purchase it. Okay. The OSRD, OK, the Office of Scientific Research and Development that was um, created to about scientific research. Think medicine. So like penicillin. OK, they also will help with sonar. You know, that's where you use underwater waves in like to locate distances. Um, radar, which is, you know, locating distances through using waves. That's not in the water. Um, 
lots of different things and they will oversee the beginning of the atomic bomb uh, later in 1942 it will become the manhattan project so again a lot of medical research um, chemical research warfare research um, and a lot of people like Albert Einstein and stuff, people who are refugees in Europe, will welcome them because they'll help us out. Unlike, you know, like the St. Louis. OK. All right. So women in the home front, um, you had a lot of women just like in World War One that will step up and help um, you know, during this time. And there's a fictional character named Rosie the Riveter. OK. And she make sure I'm muted. Okay. And she represents women in the workplace. And to me, I think people would be offended by this, but this worked in the 1940s. Um, a woman is a substitute like plastic instead of metal. Like that was a way to convince women to leave the home and work. And 24% of married women were actually working during World War II. That is huge. Okay. Um, now, did they earn the equal pay for equal work? Heck no. They earned about 65% of what a man would have earned. OK, and um, if you look, you know, they are stepping up this Rosie the Riveter by Norman Rockwell's right there. And if you look, you know, this person at Boeing, you know, that's an airplane company. I found freedom and independence I've never known. OK, so trying to convince people to support that. Remember, I also told you that a lot of women, you had the waves for like the Navy Auxiliary Corps. You had the Marine Auxiliary Corps for women. OK, so but they worked in non-combatant positions. OK, three. And like I said, 350,000 women served in the military. But if you look, they are more repairmen, clerks, secretaries, not um, combat positions. And look at all these different areas. I would just make sure, you know, maybe one example for me. I think the waves is the easiest one. OK, blacks on the home front. There is a second great migration. Um, there'll be a really, really, really bad uh, race riot in Detroit. Um, in 1943, uh, that will result in lots of deaths of different races. Um, so FDR and African Americans, there's a guy you have to know who named A. Philip Randolph, and he proposes a march on Washington. He's really mad about something. And what is he mad about? Um, so during this time, there's something called the cost plus system. So remember, I told you how think people like factories like uh, Henry Ford's factory, okay, they are going to, um, the government's going to take it over and say, you're not going to make Model T's anymore, or whatever the model is at the time. Instead, you're going to make bombing planes. OK, then what would happen is it's a contract and the government is paying Henry Ford's men to make these planes. So it's cost they're paying you. And then they're also pay paying you plus um, an incentive based off how extra you make from the quota. So um a. Philip Randolph's an African-American, and he finds out that there are a lot of these um, private companies who have these government contracts, and they're racist, and they're refusing to hire African-Americans in this factory. The problem is, is that federal government is paying these factories to operate for the war effort, and so it looks like the federal government is supporting this racism and discrimination hiring practices if they don't do something, okay? Long story short, the March on Washington in 1943 does not happen because FDR will issue an executive order, Executive Order 8802, which will desegregate na the national defense industries, meaning um, and set up the Committee of Fair Pr uh, Employment Practice. What that means is that let's say you're an African-American and there was a factory that was, you know, paid by the federal government at this time and they refused to hire you based off your race. Well, you could make a complaint to the Committee of Fair Employment Practice. OK, next, there is a new civil rights group, kind of like the NAACP, but it's core Congress on racial equality. And they had something called the double V slogan. OK, it's victory over fascism and then victory over segregation slash discrimination. OK. Remember, um, 1.2 million African-Americans served during the war. However, there were still in segregated troops. OK, um, one group kind of like the Harlem Hellfighters in World War One. You have the Tuskegee Airmen in World War Two um, that, you know, there's that movie Red Tails that really I mean, that's a great um, movie that really talks, does a great job portraying the Tuskegee Airmen and what they had to deal with.
Okay, Japanese in World War II. Um, you had the 442nd Infantry, which um, composed of Nisei. Nisei are second generation Japanese Americans, meaning their parents came to America as Japanese immigrants. And these people were born, Nisei were born in America. So they are a, a born American citizens. Um, they are the most decorated unit in U.S. military history. So that's pretty cool. Um, hold on one second. Okay, um, so while some Nisei did serve in the war, okay, a lot of Nisei actually, um, this is one of those like, you know, oops things in U.S. history. So much so in 1988, the federal government under Reagan will issue apology and um, issue 20000 to each family who was um, basically a victim of this Japanese internment policy. So there's an executive order 9066. I do think that number is important to note. This basically said that uh, because of national security reasons that Japanese Americans living in America would be sent to detention camps or um, internment camps, not concentration camps. OK, these were not death camps. Um, you know, over 100,000 fa uh, families were ordered. And we're talking like if you look at this picture right here, it's like it's kind of it's like this notice and it's like, you know, in three days you will have the military will round you up and take you somewhere. Um, so you had people who had businesses and homes and they had to sell them in three days or they lost it. Imagine how much they lost, like just were ripped off. Um, and that's one reason why uh, they will um, give them money in the 1980s. Um, so there's a guy, Korematsu, and this just shows you, do you know what Korematsu's first name was? Fred. OK, Fred Korematsu went to the Supreme Court and he believed that executive order 9066 was unconstitutional. OK, um, and the Supreme Court ruled that it was constitutional because the, it, um, they're saying that Japanese Americans are a national threat. So there were some people during the entire part of us being in the war. They were in a de detention camp, usually in California. OK, um, you also have the Bracero program. This is talking about Mexicans. OK, so just remember, I told you like the Women's Land Army and how Mexicans were welcomed during World War One because all those farmers are fighting. And so um, this was a way to encourage Mexican immigration. This would um, basically pay for it. Say, hey, um, Mexican, if you come to America and you work as a Bracero, think a farmer, you will get room and board and um you know, you, you, you'll be welcomed. And so a lot of Mexicans will flock to America during this time to be a farmer in this Bracero program. Now, there will be an altercation in June of 1943. It's called the Zoot Suit Riot. So the um, Zoot Suits, if you look right there, it's kind of like parachute pants, very big. That's a lot of fabric. And that's very wasteful during World War II. OK, you're supposed to be very simple during World War II. Like women didn't even wear nylon tights during that time. And that was you were supposed to because um, the war effort could turn those into uh, parachutes. OK, so do you see how it's frowned upon? Uh, because a lot of the Mexican men would wear these zoot suits when they would go like out on the town. And a lot of people, especially like nativists, would really um, discriminate against them because they were like, you are being wasteful. OK, well, in L.A., in this area, there's um, these, you know, there's like this Mexican happening in an area and they have these zoot suits and the um, they're U.S. sailors. So Navy sailors, they see these um, Mexicans there in Los Angeles and they just start attacking them. OK, the police come on and they allow they just sit back and watch um, these U.S. sailors attack um, these Mexicans in the zoot suit. So that's an example of a race riot um, with Mexicans and U.S. sailors. OK, Native Americans, 44,000 natives served in the armed forces. Pretty fantastic. Um, and probably one of the best noted um, contributions is that of the Navajo code talkers. That is a code that the Navajo language, OK, by this Navajo tribe in America um, used. OK, and America, like the allies will use this. OK, and what is great is like. It will allow us to really island top in the Pacific, which I'll talk about tomorrow. But the Japanese never broke the Navajo Code. Okay. 
And let me just see if there's a recap of anything, just to make sure I've covered all my standards. Make sure, again, mobilization means to get ready for war. We know that the federal government, the role of the federal government significantly expanded um, well beyond anything of World War I and the Great Depression. Like World War II allowed the role of the government to really expand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, another thing is, remember how like the Great Migration was like the um, Midwest and the North during World War One? Well, um, a lot of factories will move to the Midwest, but also to the South, especially California. Um, so a lot of new defense industries will move to the South because great climate and cheap labor um, costs, like price of livings lower and stuff. Make sure you don't forget about that double V slogan, Braceros. Yeah. All right. Uh, don't forget there's an optional quiz as you can do as many times as you want to quiz tomorrow.